I okay. am excited to take everyone back into the Thanks. 80s today. Welcome to episode 108. Welcome to Manifesting with Meg, Conversations with Extraordinary People. I have a special guest today, Chris Clues. He is the author of the series, the ultimate series on essential work and life lessons from the 80s pop culture. How much fun is this going to be? I swear it's all about love. And I really do believe that it's a wonderful opportunity to go back in time for all the love that you might have had during, especially when I was growing up. Certainly, Chris grew up during this time too, because I had the opportunity to read his incredible book, which you'll learn more about in a bit. But thank you so much for being here. This is a theme today of share the love, no strings attached, which is kind of interesting. I, I'd like to see how this, where this goes today. It's a year of empowered through purpose, transformations, dreams, inspiration, true happiness, and discovering bliss. And we are always just a conversation away from extraordinary. It's time to wake up to those ultimate dreams packed with possibility as we all do, we get intentional about the theme today with the Magical Guide to Bliss. You set your intention, Chris, and at the end of the show, we'll have you pick a number in the Magical Guide, and we'll share that synchronicity with everyone. But without further ado, away we go. Welcome, Chris. I'm so excited to have you today. Thanks, Meg. I appreciate the megaphone. I, I want to point out whenever I'm on a show like this that I I want to thank you for giving people like me a voice because without independent podcasters and people who are doing things like you're doing with your show, uh, people like me wouldn't have the voice that we have today. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, I do love to have the conversations. Certainly after, you know, I left my last job when I was cross-examining people, it wasn't as much fun as it is now. So I get to enjoy these kind of wonderful, uplifting conversations where you bring real content, real information and real exciting fun to the to the to the the leadership stage and you know before i go on i'd love to introduce everyone to you and about about your background and all the fun that you bring to to this particular show valerie welcome she's saying hello to both of us anyway hey, chris, clues. chris clues is a keynote speaker an author with a focus on the life and workplace lessons we all learn from 80s popular, I'm sorry, 80s pop culture. We can learn from 80s pop culture. Growing up in the 80s with over 20 years of leadership experience in corporate marketing, he knew three things very well. 80s pop culture, business, and the crazy thing we call life. Okay, there you go. Those three things is, I think, all you need to know for a successful future, for sure. He'll tell us all about it. But one day in his mid 40s, he was on his couch having a self pity party, like we all do, oh, um, one <laughs> for a job that wasn't working out for him. And he was watching The Breakfast Club, of all things, everyone, a fan favorite, when John Bender said, Screws fall out all of the time. The world is an imperfect place. He sat straight up and said to himself, I'm in an imperfect place. My screws have fallen out. What am I going to do to put them back in? God bless John Bender for that, right? <laughs> Continuing to flip channels, he landed on the classic 1983 movie and literally jumped off the couch when he heard Johnny Cade say, you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. Yes, he said, I do have a lot of time to make myself be what I want. He thought to himself and he left the corporate career of 20 plus years, combined his areas and expertise to create the popular book series. Like I said, the ultimate series on essential work and life lessons from 80s pop culture, which include two volumes and the third release this last September 2022, which I will show you guys all in the feed. He parlayed his books into a keynote speaking career. I love it on the same topic. Um, he's got an incredible backstory too. He graduated from Elon University in North Carolina, and he had 20 years of over 20 years of marketing leadership experience with companies ranging from Planet Hollywood to DHL. To add many more accolades to him, I want him to actually shine some light on his favorite experiences. And certainly, he wanted to let us all know he's super passionate about animal rescue, which is a huge part of his life, which I love big dog fan, animal fan here. He donates a portion of his proceeds um, from his book sales and speaking events to the rescue. So I think that's amazing. And he has a dog named Bodie Boy, which I think if you go to his Facebook page, you'll see him all the time. He's a gorgeous, gorgeous dog. He named him after Patrick Swayze's character from the movie Point Break. Bravo, great movie. He lives by the quote from the poet laureate, Ferris Bueller, which my daughter actually watched the other night because we've been talking about 80s so much. 
when he said, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it. Without further ado, Chris Clues. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Certainly, God, I, I just don't even know where to begin. 80s uh, was, were, I don't know, was an amazing time. It was such a limited time too, though, with regard to the movies and the content out there, because we had to wait, actually wait for movies to show up in the theater. But tell me a little bit more about your story. You know, certainly I, I, you know, my season six is of Howard through purpose. And when you're sitting on your couch, having a pity party, waking up to what am I going to do next with my life? That's real purpose calling to you. And I love how you spin it into something that you love and are passionate about teaching also. So tell me a little bit more about you. Yeah. So, you know, you, you pretty much covered it right there, but I will say that, um, yes, that idea of purpose and I have to kind of go back to like the 1840s for this one, <laughs> not the 1980s, okay. but Henry David Thoreau said the mass of men and today we'll call it the mass of people, the mass of people lead lives of quiet desperation. And, you know, he was recognizing that in the 1840s before people were in cubicles, before the industrial revolution, when people were working in factories, before all of this, he was already seeing that people were living these lives of quiet desperation. And that's kind of where I was. I mean, listen, I was content. I was happy. I have no complaints about my, my previous life in the corporate world in terms of what it provided to me. I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed. Uh, but there was something else for me. And it, it was, um, God, his name is going to slip my mind now. And I always talk about him. But he said something to the effect of, and it was around the same time period, that a lot of people die with their songs still inside of them. Wayne Dyer, music. Wayne Dyer. Well, 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 well actually it's Wayne no, Dyer. Before Wayne Dyer. <laughs> yes, yeah, well before Wayne Dyer. And his name will come to me later, but he said that idea that people still die, you know, a lot of people die with their music still inside of them. And I just thought like, what is my music? Because it was this corporate structure for two decades, but I feel like there's something more. And that's how I ended up here today doing what I'm doing, which is, I wanted to find a way to make a living talking about 80s pop culture. How could I do that? Yeah. I had to find a unique way to position it and one that I understood. And that's how I came up with this idea of these lessons for life and work that we can learn from 80s pop culture. Well, you know, I love that you're wearing the Breakfast Club t-shirt today. It was one of my, it was my, it was my favorite outside of Pretty in Pink. It was definitely my favorite because it felt like, you know, a representation of everybody in the world, in that one room, you know, all paying, you know, a penalty for whatever it was that they had done. I remember they were like, you know, obviously it went through the show and, and you saw what they did to get themselves there. But interestingly enough, you know, you felt seen and heard when you watched these movies. And I think that the fact of the matter is to leave it in the in the 80s would be a mistake for sure. I mean, I you know, and I, I want to go into the theme of, of love and share the love, no strings attached today. And the quote that comes up and one of my favorite Paulo Coelho is anyone who loves in the expectation of receiving some kind of reward is wasting his or her time. And it's interesting because I was thinking, wow, you know, I wonder how this plays into today's show. It, it, you know, you're talking about the 80s and, you know, your gift to the world now is to bring it back, you know, bring back the, you know, the wonderful, you know, thoughts and feelings that come from just remembering what was a time in our lives. A lot of us were very young and very excited and very, you know, just coming of age. So tell me, what are your thoughts on that quote? Yeah. So, you know, I want to go back to two quick things and I'll go to the quote, but you're right about the breakfast club and what people, I think what we need to realize is that these five characters may have been individuals in the movie, but we all have a little bit of each of them inside of us, the criminal, the brain, the basket case, the princess, uh, and the athlete, we all have pieces it. of them at some point in our lives or in our given day, maybe mm -hmm. in us. So that's what makes, makes it great as well. And I think the eighties was, I, I explained it like a glitter bomb. Somebody took a glitter bomb, threw it against I the wall, it. exploded and all these wonderful colors came out and that was eighties pop culture. And we can dive into that a little bit further later, but getting to your quote, you know, I thought about this and I thought about what are some lessons from eighties pop culture that I think could work with. Uh, this idea of, you know, this unconditional or this love without, you know, needing the, and without doing love with or talking love or, or loving people, loving things without ex the expectation of something back. Love. And so there's a great lesson from Prince, uh, the musician who loved the color purple. Oh, yeah. and, uh, in 1987, he was already known by one name. And listen, there aren't a lot of people in the world who have known, been known by one name. So you know, once you've gotten to that point, you're you're on a massive stage. 
And there was, a, there was an alternative singer. Her name was Suzanne Vega. Uh -huh. Now, for those of us who are really into music, Suzanne Vega was um, an, a great alt singer. But in 1987, there weren't a lot of people who knew her, at least as many as Prince, obviously. She had a song on the Pretty in Pink soundtrack called Left of Center. I love it. And then she came out with the song, My Name is Luca. Ah, uh, yeah. I live on the second floor. I live upstairs from you. It's a, it's a very serious song about child abuse mm -hmm. and, and neglect. And Prince heard her song. And he was so moved by it that he actually penned a handwritten note to her. And it said, Dear Suzanne, Luke is the most compelling piece of music I've heard in a long time. There are no words to tell you all the things I feel when I hear it. I thank God for you, Prince. And you can find this letter online, if or a handwritten note online. If you look up Prince and Suzanne Vega, it'll come up. Because when he passed away in 2016, Suzanne Vega put this on her social media to let people know the kind of guy he was behind the scenes. Wow. Now, how does this play into our lesson, this lesson today that you talked about with love? Well, there's a couple of things that we get from this handwritten note. Some of them have to do with leadership. So we'll put those aside for right now and focus on what, we're, what you're talking about. Hmm. And it's this idea of that encouragement doesn't cost a thing. So it. encouragement is free. Any of us can encourage somebody today. And part of encouragement is loving someone else or loving something else. And so this idea of encouragement, here was Prince on the largest stage, the biggest stage in the world. Hmm. Yet he heard this song, this beautiful song, and he took the time to let this person, this artist know, Suzanne Vega, hey, I see you greatness. I see you doing great things. Awesome. There's room on up on this stage for you as well. And he encouraged her. And that's, you know, that's loving somebody as well by encouraging them. Encouragement doesn't cost a thing. It's a really important lesson from Prince that I think ties into what we're talking about today. First of all, I've never heard that story before. So thank you for sharing it. Cause that's amazing. And the fact that, that someone, you know, I think that that's, that's really quite a beautiful advice or wisdom is that basically in everything that we do, if we reach out, even though we know that, you know, maybe it will impact or not, it doesn't matter, or just sharing a kind word or something to that effect, you know, it changes a person. And I think when you talk to people on stage, as far as leadership is concerned, people who are in leadership positions forget that they are not, they've become who they are because of the people behind them, you know, that to actually go back and turn around and say, I see you, great job, you know, is going to change a life for another or a future for someone. I'm curious with regard to, to you, who opened this whole world to you as far as like the idea, you know, I, I love it, John Bender, and, and I was reading the trading places, you know, res, you know, your and how it impacted you, you know, even with the corporate world and the greed and everything like that and the whole that movie, I, I read about that in your book. Tell me a little bit more about like how you became this kind of this author who just brings back the eighties to all of those who really can use the lessons now. Yeah. It was really that epiphany going back to watching the breakfast club. And I don't know what sparked it. I think I was in a place where I just thought there's got to be something else for me. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, like, you know, I never, I never had kids. I don't have that kind of legacy that's going to be behind me, those footprints that I'm going to leave. So the footprints I'm going to leave are up, kind of up to me. Like, what am I going to, what is going to be my legacy? Is it going to be, oh, he was a pretty good marketing guy. I felt like there needed to be something more. And I wanted to do something where I could maybe reach out to more people and do something that, you know, personally I would enjoy. And that also I may find opportunities to share these great lessons with other people and that's where the keynote speaking came from. I was also lucky enough to be around people who were entrepreneurs from a very young age. My dad was an entrepreneur. He left a, a really good career as well that was just exploding to start his own thing. Wow. Um, and, you know, my mom at the time when they were married, my mom, I was very little. And he came home and said, uh, what do you think if I said I want to leave this to pursue this? And my mom said, go for it. So he had, you talked about the support system that you need to have. He had that support system. It's the same thing that we talk about in the movie Field of Dreams. And I talk about this idea of how, you know, we need the illogical people. Uh, logical is great for bridges and roads, things that are important, but we need the illogical people. Those are the people that move us forward. Mm -hmm. And there's a great scene um, in the movie where Ray Kinsella, played by Kevin Costner, who's just basically taken the cornfields out that pay for his farm and pay, you know, and feed his family in terms of their being able to sell crop and builds a baseball diamond because he heard voices right. and his wife, <laughs> Annie is all about it. She loves it. And, you know, and she basic, she supports him 100% wow. 
and they're in the cornfield and they're looking at the baseball diamond. He says, I've just done something completely illogical. And she's like, yeah, and it's great. And she's a hundred percent behind him and encouraging him and supporting him and doing the things that she can do from her place to help him. And he's able to go on that road trip and find obviously, you know, James Earl Jones, his, his character who's fantastic and put all these pieces together that ultimately lead them to a lot more, not only just success in terms of, you know, economically, you see that they're going to be very successful moving forward, but also spiritually and um, from a spiritual perspective, you know, they find their place, what they're really supposed to be doing together. And oh, my came- God. I, 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 I have to say something just to that point. Is that, okay, it's kind of really cool how your your story is unfolding. You're on the couch. You're like, you know, what am I doing? And then all of a sudden, you know, I don't find that a coincidence, I, like, you know, that you happen upon, <laughs> you know, these movies. You know, I don't find that. But you were looking for, you were seeking wisdom to help you switch your perspective into this shift that you go from, you know, not, I wouldn't say you're a victim, but kind of like, what's next? What am I going to do? Like, this is not fulfilling to, oh my God, there's more out there for me. And why not have it be a part of these wonderful movies? And and I'm a big fan of movies. Believe me, I, I was raised on a good movie, you know, go, that was our fun. That was what we did. And for, uh, for you, it seems like this is, you're making a life out of this, which is amazing because God, it's so true to see things through your eyes and the wisdom that's there that you may not have seen because you were not in the mindset to see it, but now you bring it out. So you do keynotes, correct? You are a keynote speaker now. I love the fact that these are your quotes and I always ask for inspiration basically because I like to get new inspirational, you know, quotes that I can like take into my life. This is a great quote. I'd love for you to tell us screws fall out all the time. The world's an imperfect place. That's in your bio. It's clearly important to you. That's John Bender, the breakfast club. How do you bring this into your life when you, speak to others on stage. Yeah. So, you know, Bender, look, Breakfast Club is a fantastic movie and there's so many great lessons in the movie. There's a lot of lessons about individuality, being yourself. I mean, I, my newest book, actually, I have a lesson from each character in the Breakfast Club, including Principal Vernon and Carl, the janitor. So okay. everybody's covered there. Uh, but this particular quote, what's what the way that I talk about it is in the context of, yeah, those screws are going to fall out. In, in the business world, in your, in your work life, in your personal life, those screws are going to fall out. The why is important. You need to understand why. But how you put them back in is really what matters. And so, you know, that's we talk about the idea of living in the past or versus living in the present. And so this is my, my kind of past versus present is understanding why they fell out, but then saying, okay, they fell out. How am I going to put them back in? Because that's ultimately what matters is how you put them back in. And I chose instead of just taking those same screws, those same old rusty screws and putting them back in and going down this corporate world that I was going in, continuing to go in, that was kind of taking my soul piece by piece. I decided to get a whole new set of screws, a whole new door and a whole new door frame and walk out to an entirely new journey, which was this keynote speaking and writing these books as well. That's awesome. And you know, I remember the Breakfast Club, they're the ones who took out the screws, correct? They are the yeah, ones they did. that, you know, he was being obnoxious. <laughs> he was being obnoxious to principal, the principal. Uh, you know, it's funny. I also see the correlation that, you know, you, you can put new ones back in or two, you can take it out and it actually affords you an opportunity to think about where you want to go. And then when you're ready again, put them back in and leave, you know, leave the door wide open for you. So I love this quote. I love, okay. So I do want to point out for everybody that the background for his quotes and his book is a blockbuster. Tell us a little bit about that. You want to remind some of the audience who have no idea what a blockbuster is, what it was and what it is. And yeah, the blockbuster was actually, there's to me, there's a lot of romanticism in the blockbuster store or your local mom and pop video store. It's where we used to go to get movies. Mm-hmm. We didn't have streaming. Yeah, you might have had HBO or Showtime, but you you really were limited there in terms of the movies that you were going to get and when you were going to get them. So the video store offered you this, this amazing place where you could go to get movies. Yeah. And I still believe to this day 
that the out the human algorithm inside of a blockbuster was greater was better than the algorithm i get on netflix or amazon prime if i couldn't find the movie i was looking for somebody in blockbuster might say what movie are you looking for i'm like oh abc and they're like oh well listen here's five movies that you might really like and i almost all the time i liked all five now i get like recommendations on netflix i'm like did somebody get my netflix sign in because this has nothing to do with what i like uh but this particular image in 2019 I was in Bend, Oregon, and I was lucky enough to visit the last blockbuster on earth. And uh, I took a bunch of pictures. And when um, COVID shut everything down and all my physical speaking gigs were shut down, I moved to virtual. And I thought, I need something. I need a background that's going to speak to my brand. And I found this picture I had taken inside that blockbuster. And I'm like, this is perfect. So it was kind of meant to be, I guess. It's perfect. And you know I miss the human interaction, you know, of a blockbuster, of, you know, that date where everybody gets in the car. It's not so easy to just, even at Netflix back in the day, you had to like order your movies online. They have to be delivered and you just send them back. But, you know, I miss the human interaction because that's where the conversation begins. So I love that you're literally taking this to the stage where it can continue for sure as you speak to different audiences about this wonderful topic around the 80s and going on you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want johnny k the outsiders now my daughter is reading outsiders right now so it's really kind of fun because you know it's kind of you know we got to sit down and watch the movie again which is so different (laughs) when you're this point in my life versus when i was in my what my teenage years back in the 80s tell me a little bit about this quote again once one of the ones that you chose for your bio it's important to you obviously yeah very important and i want to point out to valerie she said uh yeah believe it or not people some people are not familiar familiar with video stores so i talk about them as much as i can because i would love to see i think there's enough quirky little towns still that could actually succeed with their own blockbuster or local mom and pop. And Bend, Oregon is a great example. I think there are probably 15 to 20 others in the country that could actually hold a blockbuster and succeed. So we'll see. Um, yeah. So back to you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. Uh, Johnny Cade, The Outsiders. Now, The Outsiders, for those of you that don't know, was actually written in 1966, 67 by a 16 year old S.E. Hinton, Susan Eloise Hinton wrote The Outsiders when she was 16. So I often say like, listen, we all have different paths. I was trying to perfect the perfect spitball in my (laughs) junior year of high school and she was writing the great American novel. So, you know, listen, um, we all have our paths, but the movie actually in the early eighties, and I want to talk really quickly before we get into the quote, if you go back and you watch the movie and you haven't seen it, you are going to see some great actors and actresses at the very beginning of their career. This movie has Ralph Macchio, C. Thomas Howe, Matt Dillon, Emilio Estevez, Diane Lane. I know I'm missing a few. Tom Cruise, um, pre-dental work. You'll see that clearly before he had his dental work done. Um, And then my favorite, Patrick Swayze. Now, there is actually a Patrick Swayze movie that I haven't seen as much as I love him. And Meg, before we jump into the quote, can you guess what that movie might be? I I think I know already. I think it it was Dirty Dancing, right? (laughs) And people get really upset that I haven't seen Dirty Dancing. I I can officially say I did put Baby in a corner because I haven't seen it. I left her there, actually. Um, So, you know, because in high school, our high school prom theme was, now I had the time of my life from Dirty Dancing. And I had to hear that song like 150 (laughs) times. I have night terrors about it and I refuse to see the movie. Anyway, back to the outsiders. You still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. The reason it's resonated with me is because as we talked about earlier, I was 46 when I made this decision to leave the corporate world behind and chase this entrepreneurial dream. I wasn't, I wasn't old by any stretch, but I wasn't young. I wasn't a 25, you know, we have these Forbes 30 under 30 and even 40 under 40, but there's no 50 under 50 years. I mean, there's none of this stuff, right? So I was older in terms of the entrepreneur and I, but I believed strongly that I still had a lot of time to make myself be what I want. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, hopefully within the next month, that will be my first tattoo on my arm here, that quote, because it means that much to me. Um, It's a really important one to let people know that it doesn't matter your age, whether you're eight or you're 88, 
you still have a lot of time to make yourself be what you want. You just need to decide what is that. And if you find a hobby, an interest, or a passion is taking up all your free time, that, that limited free time that we have, then maybe take a look at it and say, is there a way that I could actually do this for a living? Because if you're using your free time to do something, you love it. That means you have a passion for it. And find a way to try to do that. Go create you, as I say. I love it. And, and you know, I think that having a, a tattoo that reminds you all the time that that is the case will remind you when you feel like you're having a pity party again and you're like, oh, what am I doing? What am I doing? But reality is, is that you're doing really well. I think that you were on a panel with the MTV VJs for I saw that in the book. I was like, oh, my God, we looked up to these people. You know, these were our rock stars. These were our celebrities back in the day. And you're now you know, I guess you were guiding the conversation. I imagine, I don't know if you can tell us a little bit about what happened for that to happen, but I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. And Valerie, thank you. I appreciate it. I hope you really enjoy the book, um, by the way. And you're right. The music was amazing and so experimental and so much of, I don't want to sound like an old fuddy-duddy and like the music was better back then. But, you know, I, I challenge people. I say, look, if you really want to understand why I think the music was better, then, then go type in the top 40 of any week, of any month, of any year in the 80s. And what you're going to see is some like, like kind of poppy metal, like Def Leppard, right next to Depeche Mode, which was progressive, next to Kenny yeah. Rogers, which was country, next to Debbie Gibson, that was pop, next to Michael Jackson, then you get Prince, and, you, and let's throw in, I don't know, like uh, we'll throw in some Motley Crue. All of this was in the top 20 or the top 40. And I think that's what really made it different and exciting and not, I don't, I won't say that all the music sounds the same today, but I will say that most of it is coming from the same general genre when it comes to the music that's, that's quote unquote popular. So anyway, back to uh, the, the question at hand and what was the question? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I liked your answer better, but you were on a panel with the MTV VJs and I was wondering how did that unfold? How did that happen? Yeah. So the MTV DJs. Oh no, Valerie. I was saying I might, I sound like an old fuddy duddy when I say that. About how Valerie, music... Valerie is the definition of cool. She's no fuddy duddy for sure. I mean, but, <laughs> but certainly, yeah. you know, in the eighties, the sixties, all of that music that was, you know, defined that decade. It's amazing because if you go back in time, it brings you right back there again. And it makes you feel like they, they, I think there was an experiment back in the day where people who had, I think it was either Alzheimer's or dementia. And this is like with the twenties and yeah. the thirties, they put them in an environment of all the things that had were indicative of their time. And it was as if they, their memories came back to life. They were healthy again. They felt good. So I think music and also, you know, place, you know, the things that bring you back to the time when you were young, you know, certainly remind you that, you're still in that mindset. That's the things that gave you the passion that brought you to life and impacted your world. It's so funny. Cause I wonder, you know, nowadays what the kids are like, what my kids are like following that will be remembered back when they're sitting in our our seats at this point in time. But I listen, that's why I think the eighties is still resonating 43 years later, because it's, it's still resonating even with younger kids. And I, I think that's fascinating. It's cool. Yeah. But I also think going back to what you're talking about, music is something that, that really brings back all five senses. Mm -hmm. And so when we hear a song, we immediately get transported back to when that song was meant something to us or was popular. And we can see ourselves there and we can smell the smells and the taste, everything. It's really cool. The MTV DJ thing, speaking yeah. of that. <laughs> so, yes, going back to that. 2019. We don't even want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was at NostalgiaCon. I got invited out to this this 80s um, event called NostalgiaCon in Anaheim. And I moderated an MTV VJ panel and a Goonies reunion panel. And uh, and I also did my own keynote speech, uh, speech, which I didn't know how many people would show up because literally this place is full of like all of the great 80s icons. I mean, you had the people from Back to the Future. You had Land of the Lost. You had Flash Gordon. You had, you know, Heather Thomas who was on a poster in my and on, on my wall for sure. Like you had all of these people. Val Kilmer was there. I'm thinking... Who's going to come see me speak? And I had a full audience, which was really cool. But the MTV DJs, um, it was great. I got to moderate that panel and ask them questions about, you know, the old music television and some of the great videos and to tell some of their personal stories. And the Goonies was great because it was Sean Astin and Corey Feldman. So cool. um, <laughs> Sean Astin and Corey Feldman, who 
we're in this great movie that could not be more different in terms of individuals, yeah. um, but we're both totally awesome and really engaging with the audience, which I would thought was great. Like they just wanted every question possible to just keep going, keep going, keep asking us questions. It was really cool. I think that's amazing. And I love the fact that people have an interest in this. It's, it's actually something that I find fascinating to see, especially in times where there might be um, discord or perhaps, you know, um, the world seems like it's just on, a, on its way to God only knows where you go back to these times in your life where people had like remembering the same things that they had things in common. That was the thing in common, because regardless of what you took from the movie, you still felt what you just said, the feels, the senses, all of the above. Everybody who like literally was anybody after Pretty in Pink came out or Breakfast Club came out. They were talking about it at the proverbial water cooler in, in high school or in elementary or wherever you were because it was such great themes that were being thrown at us so that we could like play with it and like see how it impacted us. So I want to take us to the last beautiful inspirational quote that you share. Okay, classic. Don't forget to breathe. Very important. Mr. Miyagi, the karate kid. Okay, I'm um, go for it. Tell us the hell. Yeah. I mean, class. And so you talked about the 80s, and I think you mentioned something earlier, which was, you know, the lack of human interact human interaction that we have today. And I think that's really missing. And I think that's why, again, like no decade is perfect. Every decade is going to have its challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but what I focus on is what was the pop culture doing and was it making people feel better? And so that's what I really love about the 80s is because when you really go back and watch this stuff, it really is just it's fun. It's silly. It's even borders on cheesy sometimes. But that's what made it great. And the storylines were really simple. It, it just for me, like I just that's what I really loved about it when it came as, particularly to the to the movies, but also with the music. And I think when people go back and look at 80s pop culture, they'll realize there was a lot of really important issues being tackled in, in the, in the 80s that I think people forget. I think they really forget how, how important some of these movies were in terms of like social issues and things like that. But they did it in a way where you walked out like, man, I feel really good. But I also just like learned something pretty interesting. And so that's what I think really resonates and why people keep kind of reaching back to it. So this don't forget to breathe very important because Mr. Miyagi uh, every line I think uttered out of his mouth was a lesson, yeah. a life lesson. I mean, it's just amazing. He, to, for me, like top five movie character of all time for me, um, just his influence as I go back and I watch and I watch Cobra Kai and they bring him in sometimes the, the series, you know, they'll bring in his influences and I go back and I watch the original Karate Kid and I think what a great character and so much of Pat Moriata felt like it was really in that character. And so um, don't forget to breathe. Very important. We all think of like wax on, wax off when we think yeah. of Karate Kid. In uh, a scene similar to that one where he's doing chores to teach him about karate and patience, he's painting the fence. And he thinks that, hey, I just got to paint this little sliver of fence. And he says, no, 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 no. The whole fence. And he says, don't forget to breathe. Very important. And so this is a really important lesson about the idea of not just breathing. You know, we do it involuntarily, thankfully, because otherwise I can tell you right now, I, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. To, that's a lot to put on somebody to think about breathing 18,000 times a day or whatever we do. Uh, but this idea of breathing, whatever breathing is to you, it could be, you know, walking your dog, um, playing with your kids. Uh, having a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, working out, whatever it is that you call yoga, right? This idea of breathing is so important and, and so many of us don't do it. And I think about this idea of like stress and that stress is like dehydration. By the time you realize you have it, it's too late. And if you've ever had dehydration, uh, I can tell you it is a terrible feeling. It, it screws you up mentally and physically for several days. And it doesn't just kind of sneak up on you. It's all of a sudden, boom, you have it and you feel like you're dying. I mean, it's a really scary feeling to have like severe dehydration. I've had it. So I know. And there's, when you look back across the day, you're like, there are all these things that I could have done to avoid having this dehydration, like maybe drink some water instead of beer. I don't know. Like all these things I could have done that I didn't do. And now I'm facing this, this bout of dehydration. Stress is the same thing. Like we have all these things that build up our stress yeah. and we carry it everywhere with us. And we never take that time to breathe. Yeah. And so when we think about this from a workplace perspective, leaders, it's so important to let your team members know 
they have time to breathe. And I don't mean like a dedicated lunch hour. I mean, 30 minutes before a meeting, they may say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling something here. I need to take an extra 15 minutes just to reset. Yeah. No one's going to, you know, unless you're, you know, you're, you're, you're putting a heart in somebody and taking one out and putting one in. No one's going to take a moment here. <laughs> no, no, I, hear what you're saying. I mean, my dad had a heart transplant, so I yeah. use that example, but nobody is going to, no one's going to die in 15 minutes in terms of your corporate meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. If somebody needs 15 minutes to reset, give it to them and leaders. It's so important for you to breathe because we talk about the idea of, and I, I don't know if you swear on this, this podcast. So I'll say, we talk about the idea of poop rolling downhill. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, stress rolls downhill even, even more. And when stress rolls downhill, it takes everybody with it, the productivity, everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for leaders to take that time to breathe as well. Otherwise, we're all walking around stressed and that's no good for anyone. I, I One of the things that my mother told me before she passed away was stress, <laughs> uncontrollable stress or chronic stress will kill you, <laughs> you know, and have no regrets at the end of your days. And I think it kind of goes to to your point you know, if you are not breathing, like taking them in, sucking in the air and blowing it out, then you're depriving your brain of much needed oxygen. Because a lot of times we're going through life holding our breath, like literally because of anxiety or because of who knows what. And actually, after what you were saying, I was like, I would love to know the story of how you got dehydrated because my God, what happened that you got to the certain point where you're just like, literally, uh, you know, <laughs> I can tell you, it's just, you know, it's a stupid guy thing. Um, <laughs> it was like seven or eight years ago. And I, I got up in the morning on a hot Florida August day. I went and played golf with my buddies at the time I was dipping tobacco. I don't do that anymore, but I was, and, uh, you know, that's not exactly a good way to hydrate. Um, no. so, and then I was drinking beers instead of water and I got home and, um, took a couple hours and then I went to the gym and I, had a good sweat in the gym. And then I came home and I took a hot shower. Now still no water. Okay. No water. Hot shower. Then my friends are like, Hey, let's go grab some sushi and sake. Okay, great. There you so go. I go out that night and right in the middle of having sushi where I've had no water all day and I'm drinking sake. It hit me. Did you pass out? <laughs> I almost did. I almost did. Thankfully I knew the guy who owned the sushi place. He like comes out with a hot, like a cold towel, puts it around my mm -hmm. neck. He gets me a Gatorade that he was going to drink for, for him that evening. Says, wow. drink this, get some electrolytes in you. Wow. And it definitely took the edge off, but it was a couple of days of, I mean, you know, yeah. I was not feeling well for a few days. All because I did this, these things that could have easily been avoided if I just did one thing, drank some water. And I say that about the workplace, just one thing, take time to breathe. I love that. It. I, you know, one of the things I find really amazing is that, you know, we have inspiration all around us in many respects, in many shapes, many forms. I think that the entertainment value certainly that comes from a topic like the 80s and the movies of that time or the music that time engages a lot of people who may not be missing the other, you know, the things that they might consider very boring or very dry. But what you're saying is that you're taking all this content from a time period when these movies are really engaging, really exciting, and you're bringing it back to life. You're resuscitating it again. You're breathing life into it, so to speak. Let me just, you know, spin off of what you're saying here. And and I think that many many times, respects whatever, you know, we take ourselves so seriously. Oh, you can't talk about this in the workplace because it has to be. Blah, 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 blah. But I mean, entertainment is like how we keep our attention when the the time span of a person is ten seconds or less. You know, you have that much time to get someone's mind. You might as well use something that might grab their attention, so that at least like, oh, this is interesting. What else do you have to offer? So I'm curious when you start your, you know, your your show, so to speak, your keynote show. Yeah. What is your intention from that point? to deliver to whoever is there listening. Yeah. So I, um, my whole idea is it's, I call it like a laugh and learn. And so I want people to have a good time. I want them to be entertained. And then I want them to retain the information in a way where they can use it when the situation presents itself and going back to your idea of entertainment, that's what it does. I believe is that instead of having, you know, some PowerPoint slides with people shaking hands and, you know, groups of people and stuff like <laughs> Like get this stuff and apply it to somebody like Prince Akeem from coming to America, teaching right. you how unearned leadership creates pleasers and earned leadership creates believers or from the Goonies with inclusion, sloth and chunk teaching us about inclusion. And 
you know, all of these different lessons and how hopefully what happens is the situation presents itself in your life or work. And you're like, oh yeah, Prince Akeem. Oh yeah. Clark Griswold from Christmas Vacation. Hello. Now I remember wow. and you have something tangible to apply it to. And that's really my goal. And then the other thing is really just, I want people to walk away saying, I could do that. I could get up on stage and do that because I, I'm just a knucklehead that came up with an idea and I wanted to find a way to create a job, create a career around eighties pop culture. And I really just wanted to like en enjoy this. Right. And so I wanted it to be relatable and I walk up on stage. The first thing I do is say, look, like I talk about the trading places lesson and how confident people question themselves and arrogant people question others. Mm -hmm. And I say how I'm questioning myself when I get up here, are you going to like me in the Holy, like Sally fields? They like me. They really, really like me. Are you going to like me? You know, am I going to do a good job? Are you going to enjoy this? I don't know, but I'm going to give you 150%. And I hope at the end of this, you say, I loved that. And now I want to do that. But I have a question for you. Do you enjoy it? When you're up there, do you, so it's like, you're getting to do something that you're like, like, as Louis saying, you've got a great vibe around, you're super excited about, and it's like, oh my God, you get to talk about something that brings you back in time to a wonderful, and still like, we watch those movies. Those are our classics. Those are our classics. Those are the things that bring us to life. So back to you with regard to whether you like it or not. I mean- I love it. I mean, I, I could talk about it all day long. And I, I think, you know, I'll use not a uh, 80s pop culture reference, but a more modern one. You know, Lady Gaga said, I live for the applause. Yeah. Right. And so that's listen, when you get up on stage, you're living for the applause. And you hope that at the end of this conversation, at the end of the presentation, people, you know, in their own way, applaud you. Whether they come up to you afterwards and say, I love it, whether they want to buy your book, whether they want to talk to you a little bit further about the nostalgia of the eighties, whatever it is, yeah. you know, that for me, like that's really, and you know, um, Tupac said all eyes on me. Right. And so <laughs> that is something I really feel now when I'm off stage, I like to kind of blend in. I really just want to hang out and do my thing. And I, I don't look to be the center of attention at all, but there's something about being on that stage and really having everybody there saying, okay, let's hear what you have to say. It's nerve wracking. Believe me, my heart, is beaten 180, 200 times a second or 200 times a minute when I get up there. It's a second. I wouldn't be standing here. 100, 280 times a minute when I'm standing up there at first, like when I first get up there and it's, it's always nerve wracking. If yeah. it's not, you're doing something wrong yeah. um, because this is a whole new audience that's hearing you for the first time usually. And you want to give them everything. You want them to walk away saying that's one of the coolest things that I've heard and seen. And that, that's putting a lot of pressure on yourself, but I love it. That's a lot of pressure. On your, you know, I always say with my shows, you know, I want to introduce my audience to someone who looks at life a little differently and perhaps uses some tools and let's say looking at it from, from a different perspective, how you can apply that to your life and maybe bring it in and, you know, become a better person because of it. So one of the things I love to ask my guests is like, what tools do you use to become extraordinary? I mean, clearly you are, you've written three books, you've done so much research. I've read, I've read most of your last one. And I was just going to say, what tools did you use to get from your couch to here? Uh, I, it was a matter of wanting to do this, really. Mm -hmm. And once I saw, I wrote this little article on what the Breakfast Club can teach us about problem solving from that idea of screws falling out. And people responded to yeah. it from all over the world. I just posted on LinkedIn and I did it for fun. Like, I don't know. And then people responded and I thought, okay, I can actually do this, but where do I go from here? So it was more a matter of saying, I now want to take, I want to build a life that, that I want. How am I going to do that? And I was, you know, I, I, I guess I'm an okay writer. Like I, I know how to write and know how to tell a story, I, I think. And so I decided I was going to take those tools that I had that I'd been kind of had put to the side to focus on this ladder that I was climbing. Ladder. And that ladder didn't afford me the ability to do the things that I really wanted to do. And so it was a matter of saying, I believe in myself. Mm. I believe in what I'm doing. And I'm, now I'm going to go for it. And understanding, by the way, that there's no guarantees, you know, there's no guarantees that people that you may love what you do and you may love your content, but there's no guarantees that other people are going to, and that they're going to say, that's cool enough for me to want to purchase it and to help you build a career from it. 
And so you have to understand that. But I will tell you that you need to go into it with plan A only. There is no plan B. This is it. Plan A. There's no plan B. People are like, what happens if it doesn't work? Like, it's going to work. Like, that's it. I'm not thinking about whether it's going to not work or, or, you know, it's going to work. It's plan A. That's it. And um, I, I think that's why. And I mean, I, I just said I wrote this little book. Now what? Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. Like, I was on stage as a kid. I did a little bit of acting. I can get on stage and tell people this story. So I built a website and I positioned myself as a speaker and I sold myself as a speaker before I had even done it. I, I'd ever done it. I just said, yeah, I can do that. And then I had to figure out how to do it. So and I, I tell you what's that? Go ahead. No, I just love that plan. I always say plan A, plan A, plan A. You know, you I what, what's your backup plan? I said, no, plan A, there's no backup plan. What is my backup plan? I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's like I really hope I never need to use it, but I don't know what it is, but I guess I'll figure it out later. Well, you and know, I, interestingly enough, it's so funny because it seems that you were living your plan B as a corporate marketing person for many years. And yeah. meanwhile, plan A was calling to you and you're like, well, something's missing, you know, and it's like that's the kind of reverse that, you know, you finally say, OK, I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump. I'm going to take that leap of faith. And here you are. I, I love to ask you, what was your intention for today? Because I think that's really for me you know, coming to a show, any show, you know, being intentional about what you're giving or wanting to receive is something that's really important. So what was your intention today for the show? Well, I think first and foremost was, you know, this, these, the, these great comments that are on the side here in the chat box, having people engage and be excited about what I'm doing and tell their stories as well. And then to hear from like Louie that I have a great vibe. That's so cool. Like, that's great to hear. Cause you know, I mean, like I said, you know, you don't know until somebody tells you and then the Sally Field moment, you know, you like me, you really like me. And so, you know, that's really cool to see. I think that was a big thing for me. It was really to get my message out to people who may not know that I'm here and to let them know that, you know, you can do it as well. Um, I want to point out that there's another great icon um, from I think it was the late 80s. And so this was talk, talking about the idea of questions. Right. And so this idea of people who say they kind of know everything and you know, they never admit that they don't know. And so that's another thing is you have to admit that you don't know, that it's okay to say, I don't know. Yeah. That it's a sign of strength and confidence and character, not a sign of weakness to admit you don't know. It's honest and transparent. Because as the church lady said, Enid Strict, you know, if you know all the answers, well, isn't that special? But you know, for the rest of us, <laughs> you know, we're all out here just trying to figure this out. Oh my and, God, um, I love that. You know, I'm thankful that I found this path and I, I want to share it with as many people as possible. And, and I want people to go back and appreciate 80s pop culture because I think there's a lot, it's a lot deeper. Yeah. Yes, there was cheesy. Yes, there was like silly, but there's some really deep stuff in 80s pop culture that people miss. I mean, there's a movie called Lucas that's about a great message about bullying with Corey Haim. And yeah. Tony it's a fantastic mm -hmm. movie that people missed. Um, you have, I mean, you have a whole host of movies from the eighties that really, they were way ahead of their time in terms of the lessons that they taught us. Um, but they just, they, they packaged it up in this fun way. We all knew yeah. how an eighties movie was going to end, yeah. right? It was going to end happily. And that's I, okay. That's all right. Listen, I, I posted the song, Don't You Forget About Me. That's the classic Simple Mind song as vendors coming off the, you know, football field with arm up. I mean, come on. If you, and, you know, even in your book, you say these are the movies that we all got up and we applauded at the end. Yeah. Remember that? I mean, that's how we can, the movie theaters can never go away because it's that experience, that community experience where everyone's there together experiencing what they're seeing and receiving that. That's why movies can never go away. But at least in the theaters for sure. But what is like, so what, what number did you pick from the magical guide to correlate perhaps with, with your, your intention? Okay. I looked and I was trying to find the numbers. So I'm going to just throw one out. Yeah. Throw it out. Eight. Eight. So if you go to number eight in the book, it's page. Oh, actually it's going to be in your January section of Carpe Diem. And this is interesting. Forgiveness promises new beginnings is the intention or the insight. Forgiveness is the answer in the child's dreams of a miracle by which 
what is broken is made whole again. What is soil is made clean again. That's Dag Hammer School. Interesting that, you know, even when you start off on your journey in life, you know, going one direction, you can forgive that direction, learn what you got and then move forward. But what does that mean to you? What do you think with regard to this intention? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I am somebody who, um, how do I put this? I, I see, I think I needed to like kind of forgive myself a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, the, the 20 years or so that I spent in that corporate, that corporate world. And again, there are a lot of great things that came out of it for sure. The ability to be able to do what I'm doing today, but I think I needed to like forgive myself for taking so long to figure ah. out who I was. <laughs> and that it took a long time to figure it out, but it came to me when it needed to come to me, I yeah. think. And, you know, that, that's something that um, I would take from that is just, you know, I, I finally said, it's okay that it took this long. Love it. So I love well. it. Thank you for saying that because I'm going to join you in forgiving myself for taking so long to get where I'm going. But I will say this to your other point, you needed to have all of those lessons learned before you could step into this path. Everything that you've learned up until the point you said, yes, to John Bender and to, you know, John K, Johnny K and all these wonderful inspirational tomes, you needed that to step into this beautiful direction that you're going in. So please share with us a final inspiration today that may be coming from this gorgeous book raised on the eighties, 30 unexpected life lessons. Bravo. This is his most recent book that he published in September of 2022. I encourage all of you to go out and read it and without further ado shine some final inspiration on us today yeah that's great i appreciate the plug as well and um if i can just tell everybody that um being a little bit of a dell griffith salesman here shower curtain ring salesman from plane trans automobiles if i could do my little sales pitch um chris clues.com c-l-e-w-s.com is where you can find all the information oh you'll have time no no you'll have time to do all of that after this i just would love your final oh, yeah, okay. because awesome. I, because the fun thing is that i get to like package it and like you know share it with the world so what is your final inspiration we'll go back to make sure absolutely that everyone's going to want to know where to find you for sure okay so i'm going to improv this a little bit okay i just saw valerie's comment about die hard and um you know bruce willis is in the news a lot and it's really just i mean for me personally like i i grew up on bruce willis and so it's really sad to see that mm -hmm. at such a young age um he's having the issues that he's having and i, I watched my mom go through dementia, it's not a great thing. And so, you know, I really feel for he and his family so much so that I'm going to talk about Die Hard because in my book, that chapter was supposed to be Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And when I read the news about Bruce Willis, I decided to, you know, do my little homage to him and to let him know that there are those of us out there that really appreciated his body of work and what he did for us and, and the entertainment that he provided to us. And so we'll talk a little bit about a lesson from Die Hard. Yes. And it's the idea of, if you remember, when he was chasing the terrorist international gang, whatever they were, and he's in uh, he's in like the air vent. It's the famous scene where he's in the air vent, he has no shoes, and he just has a big lighter. And he's kind of mocking his, I, I, his wife a little bit who invited him out to the Christmas party. It is a Christmas movie, by the way. And she said, and he says, you know, come out to the coast. We'll have some laughs. And, you know, he's kind of mocking this whole idea that he was supposed to come out to a Christmas party. And now he's stuck in an air vent with a big lighter and no shoes being chased by terrorists. And he says, now I know what a TV dinner feels like. Uh. And for those of you that weren't around in the 80s, you have no idea what that joke is. But for those of us that were, he did look like he was in a TV dinner. And this, this is the idea of like, you know, facing challenges with some levity and humor. And I think that's a really important lesson that we all are going to face challenges in life. Some of them are going to be really difficult. I had a 90 day window in my life where I, in March, in the spring of 2021, uh, I lost, a, well, my, my, my girlfriend at the time, she bought an RV and took off on her journey, which she needed to take. And I knew when we met that she was actually going to leave. We both agreed on it. I understood it. I knew she had more to do with her life and we enjoyed each other and our each other's company while we had it but she had this journey that she needed to finish. I get it. Like, I don't want to get in the way of anybody's journey. I mean, I have mine. And so, but it was hard for me, you know, she takes this RV off, she goes to the woods in Oregon somewhere. And, um, and then a month later, my stepmom, who'd been in my life since I was 10, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, died three weeks later. 
And then two months later, my mom died of dementia. So it was just, my life was a country song, as I say. And uh, all along, my sister and I really used humor and levity to try to get through these challenges. And it worked. You know, I mean, every day isn't going to be an easy day. And there's not a joke in every single day. But there is humor and you can find it. And it does help you get through these things. Again, going back to 80s pop culture, why some of it resonates so much today is I think that we go back and, and these movies that were meant to entertain us and make us laugh. And they do. Even on the worst days, they can make us laugh. Yeah. Um, there's some great movies that I challenge you to watch. If you're having a bad day, watch Coming to America. It will help you. Um, and so I say that like this, this idea of using levity and humor to get through challenges is a really important one. And it does work even through the toughest challenges, losing a parent. You know, my sister and I still use humor to talk about some of the things that my mom said or did, you know, during that time where you just like, oh my God. And it is, you know, we, we do use it as much as possible. So I think that's a really important lesson. And thank you, Valerie, for bringing up uh, Die Hard because it allowed me to, to bring that lesson. So everybody. back to your book now, where can we get it and what's next for you? And, and because Louis asking, is there some inspiration we can get from Raising Arizona, which I do love that movie too. I love Nicolas Cage. He's like one of my favorite Holly, 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 Holly Hunter, right? Yeah. 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 I yeah, love that. Yeah. So, so tell us where we can find you and then give us some inspiration from Raising Arizona. Yeah. So they can find me. And by the way, the skateboards on the wall, John. Yeah. I, um, I used to do quite, a, I still have a long board, you know, I'm 52 now. So the long board is appropriate for me, but I used to, I used to skate on some of these boards in the back. Uh, so yes, I have three books actually. The first two are what eighties pop culture teaches us about today's workplace. The third one is raised on the eighties. So the first two work focus on workplace lessons. This one is much heavier on life lessons. They can be found on amazon.com or any host of digital site or sites for digital Barnes and Noble, Apple Books, Google, you can find them everywhere in terms of anywhere that digital books are sold. Um, also from a paperback perspective on Amazon and in some independent bookstores as well. And then chrisclues.com, uh, C-L-E-W-S, C-H-R-I-S-C-L-E-W-S.com. Uh, something from Raising Arizona? I don't know. What, what was yeah, so chrisclues.com, you can find a lot of my videos there. And also if you want to hire me for keynote speaking for your company event, I've spoken this to groups as small as 10 and as big as a thousand. So uh, everything's negotiable. I'm very flexible. I love speaking in my home of South Florida. So if you live in South Florida and you have a company you want to bring me in for, I love doing it. Raising Arizona. Um, you know, that's a great question. I haven't thought about that. I'll have to get back to you. I would say probably, I said before, just have plan A, but maybe Ra Raising Arizona teaches us that you should also have a plan B. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, sure. I guess, I guess if, you know, they, they figured they could just take one of the, the, the was it sextuplets? She had seven babies and they just decided to take one and leave. Then, yeah, I guess that's their, <laughs> they won't miss them. Why not? And everybody here apparently has a love for longboards and skateboards. Even Louie has one in his 70th year. So congratulations. That's amazing that, yeah, I'm sure you caused your mother and father much, uh, chagrin because worried about you guys out there in the road i know my son has um one of the scooters now and i'm not too happy about it but anyway that is life that is the change of the now what we all use to get around versus then i want to say thank you so much chris for being here today you've brought a wealth of lots of food for that movies for that 80s for that so i think that anyone here listening is going to be inspired by what you bring and certainly want to learn more. Um, one more question. What's your favorite part of the journey so far? Uh, you know, it's, I tell everybody it's every day pretty much because I'm going to relate this to the 80s. And so being an entrepreneur, especially not in your 20s or 30s, um, being an entrepreneur every day I wake up, you know, excited and terrified. And I say it's the excitement of my 13-year-old self putting my football pads on running on the field to be hit and get hit. And I loved it. Like now I wouldn't want to do that, but back then I did. So that was the excitement. And then it was the terror of like pulling myself off the wall at a middle school dance to ask a girl to dance. Like that's every single day, or maybe asking for a couple of skate at the skating rink. Maybe that's more like that. And so, you know, that's my everyday, the excitement and the terror, but I wouldn't have it any other way. 
wouldn't have it any other way. And I commend you for going out there and dreaming a big dream. Thank you all for being on Manifesting with Meg with us today to get to know more about Chris Clues and what he has to offer. I once again encourage all of you to go out there and get raised on the 80s to learn more about those unexpected life lessons that you never knew that you already knew, but needed to remind yourself that you knew. So anyway, I say go out there and get those books, learn something more, get excited. Memory Lane's a great place to go, especially when you want to know that what you've gone to or what you've shown up to now is based upon really quality stuff, which I think the 80s definitely was. Thank you so much, Chris, for this awesome conversation today. I want to remind everybody to remember that the deliberate creators of their life, and if you're on your couch and you need some inspiration, maybe throw on an 80s movie or email Chris. I'm sure that he'll be welcomed to have a conversation with you and or invite him to speak in front of your audiences as well, for certain. He's a great guest. And certainly go out there and manifest the life of your dreams. I wish you all bliss. Thank you so much, Chris, for today. Thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.